Hello and welcome to this one's own video to discuss the changes to CPI and disclosure. Uh, I'm delighted today to be joined by Richard Jones. Uh, Richard, could you be able to introduce yourself? Hi, yeah, my name is Richard Jones. Uh, I'm a PIP3 accredited senior investigating officer and a disclosure trainer with 30 years experience in policing. Fantastic, thank you, Richard. Um, now, we're here today to discuss CPA and disclosure, and 2020 was a big year when speaking of changes. Now, uh, Richard, with specific regards to the Code of Practice and the Attorney General guidelines that were introduced and updated last year, could you give us a brief overview of these changes? Yeah, uh, the Attorney General has published new guidelines which replace the 2013 guidelines. Uh, they should be read in conjunction with the new Codes of Practice for Disclosure, and both of these came into force on the 31st of December 2020. Uh, there's new guidance uh, and the codes of practice includes uh, updated uh, disclosure principles, uh, introduction of the investigation management document known as the IMD, additional duties to retain material, guidance on pre-charge disclosure, guidance on pre-charge engagement responsibilities, which is known as PCE, there's guidance on presumption, which means that certain material is likely to meet the test for disclosure. There's guidance on changes to the timing of revelation. And then there's increased guidance on specific topics such as digital media. Thank you for that, uh, Richard. Now, the regards to CPIA has been around for about 25 years or so now. Why have these changes come to force now? Well, these changes follow on from the Attorney General's review of efficiency and effectiveness of disclosure in November 2018, and that review highlighted significant concerns around the culture of disclosure, engagement between prosecutors, investigators, and defence practitioners, and the increasing challenge of the developments of digital data and technology. So the review included a series of practical recommendations, um, including earlier engagement between the prosecution and defence, harnessing the use of technology, and a cultural change to how we deal with disclosure. Um, and the Attorney General's guidelines and the codes of practice published at the end of 2020 seek to provide guidelines to address these recommendations. Thanks for that again, Richard. Now, it's helpful to have an understanding of these changes, but ultimately, though, we want to know how this is going to impact investigators. Are they going to have to update their procedures and policies? Yes, absolutely, because, uh, you know, for investigators, it's vital to keep abreast of, of these developments in able to, to ensure you can conform with best practice and continuous improvements. If you don't follow the latest guidelines, then you're not going to be complying with disclosure obligations and you could be putting your whole case at risk. Now, would you be able to, uh, to expand on those specific changes a little bit further? Yeah, well, I'll start with the updated disclosure principles. So, the Attorney General's guidelines reminds and re-emphasizes that disclosure should be completed in a thinking manner in light of the issues of the case and not simply a schedule completing exercise. Prosecutors and investigators, they need to think about what their case is about and what's the likely issues for trial uh, and how this is gonna affect reasonable lines of inquiry, what material is relevant and whether that material meets the test for disclosure. So it's very much a reminder that it's thinking about your case and not just completing disclosure schedules. There's more guidance as well about ensuring uh, the right to a fair trial, Article 6 ECHR, but also the right to private and family life under Article 8 ECHR. We know that the disclosure process rightly uh, ensures a right to a fair trial in accordance with Article 6. However, investigators and prosecutors, they must be aware that when obtaining and reviewing personal or private information from a complainant or a witness to pursue a reasonable line of inquiry, it may engage that individual's Article 8 rights to privacy. So when collecting uh, or processing personal or private material, there's a reminder that this, this can only be done in accordance with the law and only when strictly necessary and proportionate. And the latest Attorney General guidelines give clear directions to investigators and prosecutors 
on what to consider or assess if seeking the personal or private information of a complainant or a witness as part of a reasonable line of inquiry. For example, there's, there's guidance there and, and there's a good example in the Attorney General's guidelines. If, if for example, you were dealing with a historic sexual offence, there may be no prospect of any material on the complainant's phone and therefore there would be no requirement to um, secure uh, and examine the complainant's phone. Um, if, it, if it was, for example, a sex offence by a stranger, um, then the complainant's phone may contain first complaint evidence. So you would have to consider that and consider um, how you could get that first complaint evidence, but still ensure the complainant's um, rights to privacy. If you were dealing with a, an offence, for example, where the person is known to the complainant um, and you're considering um, what evidence or material could be on the complainant's phone, you'd have to consider, well, it may contain messages between the complainant and the offender. So therefore, you'd have to consider the nature of the relationship before uh, taking into custody the device, because um, clearly, if the complainant and the offender know each other, there may be uh, some background material, there may be evidence of coercion and control, which could provide um, evidence for the case or be unused material. Um, there's also an introduction of the investigation management document, which is known as the IMD. So the IMD should be used by investigators to document all key decisions in their investigation, to manage material in the case and record what approach they've taken. They're going to be required or they are required in all either way or indictable only cases and the the idea behind the imd is that it's used by the prosecutor uh, to allow them to inform and complete the disclosure management documents the dmd so the disclosure management document which is prepared by the prosecutor this outlines the strategy and approach taken in relation to disclosure and it should be served on the defense and the court at an early stage there's um, more guidance uh, around an additional duty to retain material. So we know um, retention is limited to evidence and relevant material as defined in the codes of practice. Where there's um, evidence or relevant material and it's inextricably linked to non-relevant material, which is not reasonably practicable to separate from other linked material without prejudicing the use of that other material, in any investigation or proceedings, then that material um, can also be retained. However, uh, inextricably linked material must not be examined, imaged, copied, or used for any purpose other than for providing the source of or the integrity of the linked material. So um, some guidelines there that, that, that investigators clearly need to read up on and make sure that they're familiar with. Um, the four categories of material that may be retained, well, the first one is material that is evidence or potential evidence in the case. Where material is retained for evidential purposes, there will be a strong argument that the whole thing or an authenticated image or copy should be retained for the purpose of proving provenance and continuity. The second one is where evidence, evidential material has been retained, inextricably linked, to non-relevant material, which is not reasonably practicable to separate, um, it should also be retained. Thirdly, uh, an investigator should retain material that's relevant to the investigation and required to be scheduled as unused material. Uh, this is broader, broader than but includes the duty to retain material, which may satisfy the test for prosecution disclosure. And fourthly, material which is inextricably linked to relevant unused material, which itself may not be relevant material, uh, that material should be retained as well. So again, um, it's quite complicated, but investigators and prosecutors need to familiarize themselves with this and make sure that they're compliant. There's also guidelines around pre-charge disclosure. So, um, the disclosure schedules, so streamlined disclosure certificates for the magistrate's court and the manual of guidance MG forms for the Crown Court or 
a similar form, whatever your organization uses, are now required to be completed and submitted at the pre-charge stage for all cases requiring a charging decision. So that's either way and indictable only where there's a not guilty anticipated plea and the full code is, test is passed. However, there is a caveat to that. It is accepted that this may not be feasible um, where you know, an arrest or a prosecution uh, has not been planned uh, and the suspect cannot be bailed or in large complex investigations. Uh, so again, investigators need to refer to section 72 of the Attorney General's guidelines and make sure that they are familiar with that. There's guidance on um, pre-charge engagement responsibilities, which is known as PCE. So this refers to voluntary engagement between parties to an investigation after the first paced interview, but before the suspect has been formally charged. So this is a voluntary process. And what it involves is uh, giving the suspect the opportunity to comment on any proposed further lines of inquiry. Um, it also covers a certain in whether the suspect can identify themselves any other lines of inquiry, asking whether the suspect is aware of or can provide access to digital material that has a bearing on the allegation, discussing ways to overcome barriers to obtaining potential evidence, such as revealing encryption keys, uh, agreeing and obtaining um, the suspect's consent, consent for uh, access to medical records, uh, agreeing any keyword searches for uh, digital material that the suspect would like to be carried out, and also the suspect identifying and providing uh, contact details of any potential witnesses. And then finally, uh, for clarifying whether an expert or forensic evidence is agreed, and if not, whether the suspect representatives intend to instruct their own experts, including the timescales for this. So the whole idea behind this, this voluntary engagement is that we're starting the disclosure process um, earlier uh, so that we haven't got, um, you know, post-charge um, limited timescales to get the disclosure completed. Um, it also can enlighten the prosecutors to understand what on news material and what evidence ultimately is available in the case at a much earlier stage. There's guidance uh, around presumption. So certain material is now to be treated as being likely to meet the test for disclosure. So both the Codes of Practice 2020 and the Attorney General's guidelines for 2020 now state that certain material is likely to meet the test for disclosure. And within that, there is a list provided um, on, on the list of material. It includes things like incident logs, cont contemporaneous records, of the incident and CCTV, et cetera. Uh, and this uh, material on that list is likely to meet the test for disclosure and will need to be redacted, listed on the schedules and supplied to the prosecutor. So again, investigators clearly need to, to review uh, the guidelines and the codes of practice and familiarize themselves with the, with the contents of the material on that list and establish whether it applies to their case. Uh, there's further guidance on changes in the time and the revelation to the prosecutor. So the point at which the case file is submitted to the prosecutor will depend on the circumstances of the charging decision and the anticipated plea. Where the investigator is seeking a charging decision under the full code test and it's anticipated that the defendant will plead not guilty, the unused material schedule should be provided to the prosecutor by the disclosure officer at the same time as seeking this charging decision. So previously in the past, um, we've obviously had a disclosure officer appointed in our investigations, but many times we've not provided the disclosure schedules at the point of seeking a charge. Um, and clearly there, there are changes now, um, but there is a caveat, Attorney General guidelines uh, acknowledges that sometimes it's not feasible to provide the news material schedules to the prosecutor at the same time seeking charging decision. Um, that's obviously um, if the investigation is fast moving and a charging decision is sought almost immediately. 
where the suspect has been charged on the full code test and a not guilty plea is anticipated, then the unused material scheduled should be provided to the prosecutor at the point at which the case is submitted. In all other cases, the disclosure officer must provide the schedules as soon as possible after a not guilty plea has been either indicated or entered. And there's some guidance around large and complex investigations where clearly it's recognised that the preparation of schedules continues beyond the point of charge due to the quantity and complexity of the data to be analysed and that it may not be feasible or necessary to provide the schedules at the same time that a charging decision is sought. And then um, to, to finish off, there's increased guidance on specific topics such as digital material, third party international inquiries, and how this should be set out on the disclosure management document. Uh, investigators need to familiarise themselves with Annex A in the Attorney General's guidelines, which provides guidance on obtaining and handling digital material. Um, I must stress it's not an operational guide, but it does set out uh, the best approach, best practice. It sets out how relevant material and material satisfying the test for disclosure can be identified, revealed, and if necessary, disclosed to the defence without imposing unrealistic or disproportionate demands on the investigator and prosecutor. It also provides guidance on handling sensitive personal information in accordance with the obligations under the uh, data protection legislation. So to, to, to summarise that, what I would say is um, investigators and prosecutors uh, and defence practitioners clearly need to familiarise themselves with the uh, new guidelines published by the Attorney General and the codes of practice, because um, if, um, if you don't do that, you're not complying with disclosure and you could put your case at risk uh, of being inadmissible or discontinued or certainly having uh, disclosure problems at the trial stage. Many thanks for your time today, Richard. That's been uh, incredibly enlightening. Um, thank you very much for watching and any questions, please don't hesitate to contact Juan Solo.